Welcome to the Antiquities Coalition's ongoing series of presentations on how to fight cultural racketeering and protect the world's cultural heritage. Welcome to the webinar, The AC Digs Into the Misadventures of a Stolen American Relic, the story of the lost, then found, then lost, then found Bill of Rights. I'm Deborah Lair, Chairman and Founder at the Antiquities Coalition. And the Antiquities Coalition is a not-for-profit that unites a diverse group of experts in the global fight against cultural racketeering, the illegal trade in art and antiquities. This is a very timely discussion that we're having today with the advent of July 4th, our Independence Day, but also with the discussion swirling around Black Lives Matter and the importance of rights of all citizens. We're so fortunate to have the author of the book with us today to discuss his book, Lost Rights, The Misadventures of a Stolen American Relic, David Howard. And David is the author of several widely acclaimed books, including his most recent, which was Chasing Phil, The Adventure of Two Undercover Agents with the World's Most Popular Con Man. Charming Con Man, excuse me. And he is the executive editor of several, has been the executive editor of several widely acclaimed magazines, award-winning teams, including Popular Mechanic and Bicycling. He has written for many publications, including the New York Times, Travel and Leisure, and National Geographic's Traveler Magazine. Uh, just to give you a brief overview of the technology, we will be recording this webinar and it will be posted on our YouTube channel for your viewing later. And we welcome you to be part of the discussion to submit your questions through our chat function. Please just identify yourself and your affiliation. So this book reads just like a fictional novel. A television celebrity antiquities dealer is provided an opportunity to buy through a family that has held this artifact for over a hundred years one of the only four, one of 14 original Bill of Rights, and then engages in secret negotiations to sell it, only to become the focus of a sting operation by the FBI. David, tell us how you came across this story and what inspired you to tell the tale. Sure, uh, thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I learned about the story right after the FBI um, uh, seized the document in 2003. I had a magazine editor who I had worked with frequently call me up and say, uh, you know, this really interesting thing just happened in Philadelphia. Do you want to look into it and see what, what you can make of it? And um, I started to uh, try to unravel the various threads of the story. And um, it was immediately clear to me that this was a really remarkable story. You had the Bill of Rights, which is one of the top few documents in American history, if, if not human history. Um, you had the events at the climax of the Civil War uh, when the document was stolen. And you had this cloak and dagger kind of story of a priceless artifact, you know, moving through uh, back channels of the antiquities world. And as you mentioned, this uh, TV star, the Antiques Road Show character who seemed to have been caught red-handed um, doing something um, that looked pretty pretty questionable. Um, and of course, an FBI sting um, at the top of a skyscraper in Philadelphia. So um, it was really clear to me right from the start that this was a pretty incredible tale. And um, I, it took me some time. I, I had to wait a couple of years because the Initially, right after the sting, there was, as you can imagine, a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of litigation. There was a lot of tension on the part of the people who were accused of wrongdoing, and nobody was really saying very much at that point. And so, I let um, about three years go by and started to circle back to it. And at that point, I was able to um, gradually unravel what had actually happened um, over those 138 years that the, the document was missing. Um, but yeah, I mean, I really, it was just came down to a matter of recognizing an incredible story when it 
that fell out of the sky onto my desk. That's interesting. So first you, you start by telling the story essentially of how it came to fall into the hands of the family and the background that there are actually, as far as we know, 14 original Bill of Rights, right? One for every 13 states and one that stayed in the possession of the United States, the, the, the uh, central government. And so were you aware of others? I know that the one that you write about, North Carolina, is not the only one that is missing. Right. Yeah, it was remarkable to, to learn um, about, you know, the, the way that these documents had been handled or mishandled over, over the 200 plus years of the nation's history. It really took us a while as a country to kind of get our act together with keeping these things in good shape. And so at the time of the seizure um, by the FBI, the sting, um, there were actually five copies of the original 14 that were, were missing. Um, New York and Georgia, uh, Pennsylvania and Maryland and North Carolina all had lost or uh, had some fate befall on their copy, their original Bill of Rights. Um, and so uh, I learned over time that other states had um, lost theirs as well and recovered them or just had different different things happen. They would, um, in South Carolina, one of them, uh, they saved it from Sherman during the Civil War, but it um, subsequently was misplaced in the basement where there was a bunch of, you know, water and mold damage. Um, and New Jersey had this pretty funny story where they, um, theirs was stolen and it turned up in an, anti, um, an art catalog in New York City and they got it back and then subsequently misplaced it again uh, and lost it for another 50 years. So there were just a lot, a lot of these kind of kind of um, incredible fumbling stories of, of um, you know, mishandling that uh, now fortunately has been, um, most, most of us are doing a lot better job of keeping track of these things. And how did they but, identify this one as the one that belonged to the state of North Carolina? Well, it was very tricky because um, this character that we've mentioned a couple of times, um, Wayne Pratt was his name. He was an, an appraiser on the Antiques Roadshow and uh, came into possession of this particular copy of the Bill of Rights um, in the late 90s and tried for several years to sell it um, in different ways. He initially acted as a broker. Um, mm -hmm. Then he bought it himself and was trying to sell it. And um, the way that he dealt with the problem of um, the fact that the that document had been stolen during the Civil War was to obscure its history. Um, he created, um, uh, sort of, he, he made up a story that was different um, uh, about its background, different than the truth. Mm -hmm. And uh, essentially he was telling people that there was no way to prove you know, where it actually came from. Um, and, and so that was, uh, to get around any of the rules at the time, right? That the rules that it might belong to a particular state. Exactly. Yeah. He knew that North Carolina, if as soon as the state became aware that um, the document belonged to uh, that state, that they would move very aggressively to get it, get it back. Yeah. Um, and so what ended up happening was really interesting. The document eventually made its way to the offices of um, something called the First Federal Congress Project in, in Washington. Um, it's this group of historians who have spent decades um, gathering and cataloging and publishing the every single document created by the First Congress mm -hmm. from 1787 to 1789. It's this um, really fascinating, um, very specific kind of project. And they've become these extraordinary experts on um, documents created within these first three years uh, of the nation's history. And uh, one of them looked on the back of this document in question and saw this very faint uh, notation on the back uh, and was amazingly able to immediately recognize it as the handwriting of this obscure clerk, you know, in Raleigh, North Carolina in the 1700s and said, that's North Carolina's document. That's, I know wh where it came from. And um, that moment set in motion um, a series of events that would end up with the, 
um, an undercover FBI agent in Philadelphia um, getting the document back. Uh, that's fascinating. And, and it, it was with the FBI art crime squad who got involved, right? Who have been really some of the leaders in um, some very important uh, sting operations in recovering a lot of stolen art and antiquities. They do an amazing job. And so in this one, it was, it's pretty amazing when you can get an original Bill of Rights. So that must've been a very exciting moment. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, it was, uh, fittingly, it was recovered by the guy who actually was the founder of this really um, important organization within the FBI, that this um, art squad. Um, his name is Bob Whitman. Um, He's a super fascinating character, um, now retired, but I think this was one of the, you know, it's actually in his own book um, featured. And uh, I think it was one of the highlights for him just because of the historical s significance of this document and the value of it. Um, people were talking about this being worth as much as $40 million and the fact is that it, it's actually priceless because um, you know it can't legitimately be bought and sold. It's it's um, clearly government property, has no place in the in the private marketplace, and so um, to be able to return something like that, uh, I think was a, a pretty seminal moment for him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is really amazing. So as you as you go through, there are many different elements to this. I mean, including the legal aspects. Uh, there was a law passed you write about during the Civil War that uh, expressly forbid looting, and yeah. that came that law came into play in the reclaiming of the Bill of Rights because it was a very clear violation of the law at that time that the soldiers went in and took it from the Capitol in Raleigh. But what else did you find as you were digging into this that really surprised you? Well, I, I think um, that one was a big one because when I started researching it, um, people would tell me to the victors go the spoils. You know, there's this idea that um, uh, you can just kind of, when you win a war, you can take what you want and bring it home. And um, I think the, in this case, as you mentioned, there was this, Order Special Order 88, it was passed by General Sherman. Um, and the idea was that he had um, adopted this doctrine of total war during the actual, you know, active combat stage of the war, it was devastating to the South. And when the South surrendered, he really wanted to try to make it whole again as quickly as possible. And the intent of this order was to um, have everything returned to the state as much as possible. Um, that try to limit this uh, kind of looting and and um, and theft. And I think what surprised me was, you know, the a soldier went into the state house, found this um, original rendition of the Bill of Rights, brought it home to Ohio, a uh, small town, uh, spends a year just kind of, it's uncertain what he even did with it, but decided pretty quickly that he didn't really care that much for it and um, ended up selling it to one of his childhood friends for five dollars um, which would uh, just go is one of the funniest single facts or most interesting single facts of the whole story of the five dollar acquisition which I guess was a pretty fair amount of money in those days but still um, and uh, the, the purchaser uh, name was Charles Shotwell would end up keeping it it would stay in his family for the next uh, 120 something odd years. Um, so it was a pretty significant moment, but I think it was surprising that $5 say was kind of emblematic of how sort of little valued, um, little cared for these um, are uh, what we now consider to be priceless artifacts were at that point. A lot of people just kind of thought of them as, you know, nothing particularly important. Well, and now you write that this is a big trade, that the market in these historical documents is very robust. And it must be a very challenging area because as you mentioned earlier, many of these are actually government property. And so did you find that there is somewhat of an underworld in the trade of these historical documents? 
Yeah, and I think it's particularly, I think, you know, all antiquities, as you all know very well, uh, um, the marketplace is, is tricky and it's filled with um, problematic objects, objects that shouldn't be out in the public domain that belong somewhere else. And with documents, um, it's particularly problematic because of this history of, of sort of poor caretaking that took place um, that a lot of these things were were, were taken from official custody in the 1800s. Um, it was a particularly bad time for um, the nation's archival uh, history. And uh, a lot of them ended up, you know, gone for, for so long that it's unclear when they were taken, how they were taken, whether they actually do belong to um, uh, a public entity, a government. Um, and a lot of times with these sales, what ends up happening is um, they run into what, what is referred to as a dead man's provenance. Uh, I got this thing from so-and-so person mm -hmm. uh, who's now dead. And so I never, I can't get the full story uh, of where it came from and neither can you. You can't go back to him and interview him about um, where this thing came from. And, and so you kind of run into these dead ends where you, when you're trying to, um, establish what actually happened. Mm -hmm. In the case of the Bill of Rights, it was pretty interesting because the family, the Shotwell family, did a really good job of, of recording how they had come into possession of this. Uh, all the different, there were two different um, interactions with the state of North Carolina um, mm -hmm. regarding the document. Um, but it was, they laid out this sort of clear trail of breadcrumbs about where the, you know, how they had gotten the document and where it came from. Um, so it was unique in that regard. And there was still the, the um, as I mentioned earlier, the docketing in the back, the notation that um, made it clear. So Wayne Pratt had a pretty, the antiquities dealer uh, who you mentioned was quite well known because he had, had built up a following and was on the antiquities road show. So he was a very well known dealer in sort of the Americana. And so he would have known what the provenance was of this. It was well documented. He was told when he bought it from the family. Is that correct? That's right. He um, he interacted directly with the family. Um, there was Charles Shotwell originally, then his son owned it. And then uh, in the end, his two of his granddaughters were the caretakers. At this point, they had had it for a hundred something years within the family. They were concerned about um, their ability to, to adequately care for it. And they also realized, quite frankly, that the marketplace had uh, gone pretty stratospheric in all that time they had owned it. Owned it. And so they saw an opportunity to both kind of get it into the hands of somebody else who could care for it better and make a lot of money. Um, mm -hmm. And so in their attempt to sell it, they ended up connected to uh, Pratt and uh, he originally, as I said, tried to broker a deal, mm -hmm. um, was unable to do that, ended up over time kind of <laughs> in his way, uh, grinding them down over a period of years from their original asking price of $2 million down to um, 200000 mm -hmm. And part of his deal with them was um, a full confidentiality agreement where they had to um, agree never to um, talk about the document or where it had come from. And this essentially allowed him to seal off the, the story, the history of the document. And mm -hmm. at that point, he switched tracks and started trying to sell it um, as this kind of unknown um, entity that uh, he made up the story about it being discovered in a, um, in, inside a frame of a painting in upstate New York somewhere mm -hmm. um, that was complete fabrication. So there was talk at some point of trying to sell it back to North Carolina, wasn't there? Yes. Yeah. They, um, there were a couple different points when um, there, was, there were attempts to sell it back to the state. Uh, the first one was in the 1920s with the original own, uh, owner, um, original buyer, Charles Shotwell. He, when in his uh, uh, later years of his life, tried to sell it back and the, ended up having this really um, kind of entertaining um, series 
of correspondence with the state where the state, you know, just really kind of smacked them down and said, we're never going to pay for that and hope you enjoy, you know, your lack of scruples and keeping it. Um, and then uh, nothing happened with it for about 70 years. Um, and when Pratt came in contact with it and started trying to um, broker some sort of transaction, he had his lawyer reach out to North Carolina. And essentially, there was this, again, kind of bizarre cloak and dagger exchange of correspondence where uh, Pratt's lawyer said, you know, uh, I know someone who knows someone who knows someone else who's got this thing that you might want. Uh, <laughs> and um, they had uh, a, kind of these conversations that went back and forth over a period of a few months. And um, uh, North Carolina has historically been very consistent about the fact that they will not uh, spend a cent to uh, reacquire property that um, uh, belongs to the state by law. And uh, they had a court ruling in the 70s that upheld this principle that um, once it's state property, it's always state property. And, and so um, the second interaction ended in a similar way to the first where the state just said, don't expect to squeeze, you know, a dime out of us. Um, we just want it back. So um, it didn't go anywhere and, and um, kind of drove Pratt to come up with this, um, you know, alternative story about, about where it came from to try to get around the problem that he had with them. So then you write, so he was just about to make a major sale when, right, and it was, it was part of that sale actually to the state of uh, Pennsylvania. Right. That when the sting operation occurred, right? Yeah, exactly. He thought that after a four or five years of um, trying to find a buyer for this thing that he actually had uh, found one, it was through, he, he at this point was working with some um, very prominent, legitimate um, anti historical document and book dealers um, in the in the Connecticut and um, New York City area. And uh, these people were operating under the pretense that they, under the belief that they were, you know, doing legitimate a sale. Mm -hmm. um, and so they ended up approaching, it was, it was seemingly this incredibly elegant solution. They um, ended up approaching the National Constitution Center in Philadelphia, which happened to be opening um, uh, within a, a year or two of this, um, of them approaching with this document. And um, it seemed like this incredibly perfect thing, this major American museum opening. Right. It's about the constitution. Here's the bill of rights, you know, the, um, this incredibly important part of the constitution. And um, the deal initially got hung up over this question of where the document had come from. And the Constitution Center was very wary of this story that they were hearing about, you know, the picture frame in upstate New York. It was kind of this almost too good to be true kind of story. And um, the museum was actually the impetus. They were the driving force behind the document going down to Washington to be reviewed by these experts who I mentioned earlier. Um, the first federal Congress project. And um, once, once these historians identified uh, the background that it actually was from North Carolina, mm -hmm. the museum kind of had this, you know, kind of moment where it was kind of like, okay, what do we, what do we do now? Like we, we actually know where it came from. Um, and it led to uh, them reaching out to North Carolina. And there was this, kind of incredible moment at one point where the governor of the state of Pennsylvania was calling the governor of the state of North Carolina and they were kind of having these conversations where it was like, you know, we got this bill of rights, it turns out it's yours, what do you want us to do? And the governor in North Carolina was like, I'm not really sure, let me try to figure it out. And, um, you know, it, uh, it, it, was, it was kind of a remarkable thing um, and it, obviously eventually worked its way around to we're not paying for that we're still not paying for it we haven't paid for it before we're not going to pay for it now and uh they ended up um 
North Carolina officials ended up deciding to reach out to the um, Justice Department and ended up with Bob Whitman in their uh, in their offices and uh, and then you know Whitman had to go to the museum and mm -hmm. these officials and say all right so you're gonna co-op you're gonna work with me on this undercover sting and uh, they were a little you know they were kind of shocked and and uh and a little bit unnerved by that at first um they had this told me this joke about how the director of the museum and the lawyer for the museum after hearing this was kind of that old sitcom comedy routine where they both try to leave go through the door at the same time trying to get out of the room and get jammed in the in the doorway um but obviously ended up uh agreeing to take part in it Great. Well, we have a, a question from Joan McEntee, who uh, has, is asking, do the people who, who deal in this kind of trade, do they really do it for the money or do they do it because they want to be a part of American history? Well, I think it depends on who, what their motivations are and who, you know, um, what their connection is to the um, artifact in question. I do actually think that Pratt was somebody who um, he wasn't just a mercenary um, in this. He was somebody who I, I think history was actually important to him. I think he believed in the importance of this document. And I think, you know, I, um, it, I think I was the only one to point out with regard to him that um, as much as he created this fabricated story and um, sold, tried to sell the document under very dubious circumstances, um, he also took immaculate care of the document and actually could have, because the document is made on parchment rather than paper, which is essentially a animal skin, um, you can you can scrape off the ink and you could, he could actually could have scraped off the documenting off that um, mm -hmm. helped identify where it came from. And other copies, at least one other copy of the Bill of Rights, mm -hmm. um, there was one in the New York Public Library or is, um, and that one, whoever stole that one um, scraped off the docketing on the back. There's actually a, a place where the, the skin, one mm -hmm. of these historians um, told me he reviewed it himself. And um, so Pratt decided not to do that to his credit. And, um, you know, he was in some ways a victim of his own values. So I think these things are very complicated. I think people get involved in with them for, for complicated reasons. Um, and I think part of it is greed yeah. for sure, because of the value, the way these things have um, gone so stratospherically high in value. But I think, I think there are plenty of people involved with them who are, are collectors who want to preserve things, who want to make them available to the public in some way. Um, and it's it's a it's a hard thing to try to pin down i think it's mm -hmm. in some ways the stories of how they move through the marketplaces are as unique as the object itself right so what what advice based on what you've uncovered in writing this book what advice would you give to dealers and collectors well i i mean i think it's yeah the, the same advice goes to both that's really um you know think about do your best eff possible effort to try to um, gather the full provenance, gather the full story of where it, it's come from. And um, if it's clear that th these things are, belong to some public entity, I think, um, you know, they, they, they need to be returned. Um, and, and we, there's no more gray area like that. Um, we lived, as I said, for about 200 years in, in this, kind of like wild west atmosphere with these documents where a lot of them just were so poorly cared for um, and protected that that, that um, they were stolen and and their histories became obscured but now um, you know there's there's kind of no excuse for not paying attention to uh, where a document must have come from how it uh, how it uh, made it to where wherever it is if it's in some um, private marketplace, uh, there has to be a clear line, a clear chain going back to establish that it um, that it can be legitimately bought and sold. Yeah.
Well, uh, at the Antiquities Coalition, we have a series that does trace the story of a number of these lost antiquities and recently put out a top 10 list of, of uh, global antiquities that have been lost in hopes that the public will find them and will have more stories to tell about the lost history of a number of these and how they've been recovered. David, we really appreciate you joining us to tell the story of one of the most important documents in American history, the Bill of Rights. And for all of you, please buy his book, really fantastic, David Howard, Lost Rights. And um, for anyone uh, who would like to follow up, you can send him questions through the Antiquities Coalition website. And as I mentioned earlier, we'll have this posted on our YouTube channel as well. Thanks to all of you for joining us. We really appreciate it. We know there's a lot going on at this time, but we think this is such an important story to tell, uh, particularly as we face Independence Day. David, thank you, really. Thanks for having me, it was a pleasure. This story and this excellent book, great. Thank you. Bye.